Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful to be in your house with your people here today. There are so many out in the world that are missing this wonderful blessing by coming together, encouraging one another, being one together with you. I would ask now that your Holy Spirit would be with us this morning. Be with me in a special way as I share today in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you remember the Rockefellers? Didn't we have a vice president by that name, I think, at one time? Do you know what his son's name was? Michael. Anybody remember what happened to him? Probably some of you aren't old enough. On November 19, 1961, he disappeared, Michael Rockefeller. He was the youngest son of U.S. Vice President Nelson, Nelson Rockefeller and a recent graduate of Harvard. Michael went on an anthropological, is that the way you say that? Some of those big words get me. Expedition in New Guinea. On November 17th, his team was traveling in the Pacific Ocean when their 40-foot dugout canoe was swamped and overturned miles from shore. Two of the guides told Michael and his partner, Dutch anthropologist Rene Wassing, to wait in the boat while they swam for help. But as the hours went by, and their boat floated aimlessly, Michael told Rene, we don't know if they're gonna make it back. They may never ever find us out here. I think I can swim to shore on my own. With that, he jumped into the water and swam away. And he's never been seen since. The next day, Rene was picked up. The disappearance of Michael created an international media, media frenzy. His father, father flew to New Guinea to help organize a massive search, but they could not find his body. Some speculate that he was attacked by sharks. Others say he was eaten by cannibals. But that what seems is that he, if he had stayed with the boat, if he would have stayed with the boat, he would have survived. Have you ever been tempted to jump ship? No, I don't mean hurling yourself out of a boat and swimming away as Michael Rockefeller did. Rather, growing numbers of people are bailing out of the church whether it is because another member in the church hurt them, they became distracted by the world's temptations, or they were simply bored. Thousands slip overboard, and many never return. Though the church has its imperfections, members who don't walk the talk, and leaders who don't hold to the highest standards Life in the vast world, the ocean, can be dangerous. Many who become fed up with the church and slip over the edge find themselves swept away from God by the storms of life. If you're thinking about jumping ship today, I want you to know there are good reasons to stay in the boat. Despite the many problems and the spiritual storms that threaten to capsize the vessel, I encourage you to stay with God's church because it is much safer than swimming with sharks. A Bible story about a sinking ship powerfully illustrates this point. You might want to turn in your Bibles to Acts 27 where this story is told and most of us know this. Uh, 
So just turn there for now, and I'll, I'm going to pick out a few verses, okay, as we go along. Later in his life, the apostle Paul was arrested and imprisoned. Seeking a fair trial, he appealed to Caesar directly. As a result, he was loaded on a ship full of prisoners and guards and sent off to Rome. We all know this story, but it's good to review sometimes. The entire chapter of Acts 27 tells the harrowing story of their encounter with a fierce storm at sea. During the journey, a ferocious tempest came upon them and the crew began throwing everything overboard to lighten the ship and keep it from sinking. For several weeks, how long? Weeks. I mean, just one storm for a day or two is enough to get to me, but several weeks? They were violently tossed about, unable to determine their location because of cloudy skies. Paul interceded in prayer for everyone on the boat, and an angel responded, verse 24. You might want to look at that. And the angel said, saying, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. <clears throat> and lo, God hath given thee all them that shall that sail with thee. He shared this good news with the crew and concluded, verse 27, how be it, we're going to survive, he says, but how be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. As they neared land, some of the sailors decided to jump ship in an attempt to save their lives. They tried to lower the only lifeboat and sneak off by themselves. Paul's, Paul saw them, verse 31 Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Except these abide in the ship. Lord, when we see folks leaving the ship here, we need to work with them and bring them back. So the soldiers quickly cut the ropes to the skiff and let it fall into the sea. Eventually the, stip, the ship did strike shore and incredibly, how many of the passengers survived? All of them, all of them. Listening to the Lord, all of them survived. I'm sad to say and to report that large numbers are leaving the church the Barner Research Group found that three out of five young Christians disconnect from the church after the age of 15. You young people, I don't want to see any of you leaving. And we need to encourage each one of them, okay? That's the future of our church. While some do come back, many permanently walk away. I have six children. All of them were out of the church at one time. Two have returned. Thank you, Lord. And I'm sure praying, and I hope you pray too. I got four more that need to return. A 2014 study in North America showed that more than 1.2 million leave the church every year. That's about 3,500 souls a day. Now that's what we're not talking about. We're talking about Christian church and whole here. In 2008, the Southern Baptist Church with a membership of more than 16 million found that only 38% of its members even attended church. The Evangelical Lutheran Church conducted a similar study and discovered that just 28% of their members did the same. While the Gallup poll has pegged attendance numbers to 36%, further research shows that many Christians lie about church attendance. A Christian lying? And the true numbers are closer to 
The Bible emphatically encourages Christians to gather together. Hebrews, you want to look that up. And this is the one my wife just read. Looking at verses 24 to 25. I'll give you a few moments to get there while I get a little something. Still have a little problem coughing at times, so. Hebrews 10, 24, verse 25. And let us consider one another to provoke. Ah, oh, have you done any provoking lately? There's good provoking and there's bad provoking, isn't there? Provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. What's that word mean, exhorting? Encouraging, right? Encouraging one another. And so much more as you see, what? Approaching? The day. Which day are we talking about? Let me tell you, folks, if you look around the way the world is right now, the Lord is coming and it's not very far off. We need to be ready and we need to encourage each other, okay? Those who claim the name of Christ should not live separate lives from other followers. We come together for worship and mutual encouragement, especially as we see the nearness of the second coming. There is redemptive value in the gathering together. One reason Christians attend church is to learn to love others. <laughs> Some of us aren't very lovable. Have you noticed that? So let's look at 1 John 4.21. 1 John, I'll give you a few minutes to get there. 1 John 4, verse 21. I still hear a few pages. That little book in the back, you got Big John and Little John. First John 4, 21. And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. So who's your brother? Everyone. I like that. Everyone. We're all children of Adam and Eve. <laughs> so we're all related folks, aren't we? We're all brothers and sisters. Some mistakenly believe that we go to church so that we can associate with <clears throat> good people. How many good people have you seen in church? <laughs> Not, we're all sinners, aren't we? Really? But we're forgiven sinners, aren't we? Thank you, Lord. They wrongly see the church as a resort for saints. In reality, the church is more like a hospital for sinners. People aren't always lovable. Have you noticed that? And the way you learn to love as Jesus loved is by loving the unlovely. I don't know about you, but I was pretty unlovely a few years back. But the Lord stepped into my life and made a little difference, made a big difference. If you have ever thought that you would stay away from the church to be more holy, your very act shows how much you need the church. You might be hanging over the edge of the boat. You may be discouraged, pondering the idea of taking off into the world. But the Holy Spirit is calling to your heart to stay in the body of Christ. It is a delusion to think that an active, healthy Christian can be separated from other Christians. Unless you have medical issues 
or are homebound for some reason, good reason, you should make every effort to worship with others. This is why the Sabbath is called a holy convocation. Remember, the church is not the building. It is a gathering of God's people who come to worship their creator, fellowship with one another, and evangelize the world. The Greek word for church in the New Testament is ecclesia and comes from a compound word that means to call out. The church is a body of people called out of the world and joined together through faith, faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Do you realize he's here right now today? Amen. Him and his angels, the Holy Spirit. Can you be a Christian and not be connected to God's church? That makes about as much sense to be, be a salesman without customers or a football player without a team. Can you picture a quarterback throwing a football to himself, running out there and catching it as the defense swarms him? It is a humorous picture, sure, but when applied to the church, it is just sad. Jesus never intended his followers to exist as hermits. In the last half of Acts 247, it says, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you're interested in being saved, then you'll be added to the church. The idea of being saved apart from the church is a foreign concept in the Bible. Some say, I'm not going to attend church until I know that I'm following Christ. After all, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Actually, it is for that very reason that you should go to church to follow Jesus more closely. The Holy Spirit was poured out in great measure on an assembled group of believers. And it is when we gather together to hear God's word that we may fully come under the conviction of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul sent a letter to the young pastor Timothy. In 1 Timothy 3, 15, you, you want to look that up? I don't know, maybe you do. 1 Timothy 3, 15. And I'm just going to read the last part of that. That thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Staying away from the church will not keep you spiritually alive. How many of you like stories? I like little stories, don't you? I always try to include a story or two. I think you'll like this one. Years ago, a pastor went to visit the home of a busy farmer who had stopped going to church. As the two sat in front of the fireplace, it must have been a cold morning that morning or that day. The farmer said, Pastor, I'm still a Christian. I just don't need church right now. I still believe and pray. God knows my heart. The pastor wasn't sure how to respond, but he leaned forward, picked up the fire poker, and separated one of the burning pieces of firewood from the others. The two men sat looking at the piece as it burned by itself. For a while, the fire on that piece continued to glow, but then it went out. 
Neither of the men spoke a word until the farmer turned to his pastor and said, I get the message. I will be coming back to church. You know, when we're together, I think we're told to press together, press together, press together. There's three times that was said. We're to press together. When we go apart, we lose our connection, folks. <clears throat> Friend, you cannot burn brightly for Christ when you stay away from his church. You cannot worship or grow in faith all alone. God wants you connected to the body of Christ. Don't try to go it alone or you will die spiritually. Just as a child needs a family, just as a lamb needs a flock, a Christian needs a church. So hang in there. I imagine that when Noah and his family were living in the ark during the flood, there must have been some unpleasant moments. Can you imagine that? Wasn't it 11 months or a whole year they were stuck on that ark bouncing around in the waters? The constant rocking of the boat, the deafening noise of the countless shrieking animals and their smells. The work of feeding all those furry passengers and mucking their stalls. There must have been several times the family of Noah wished to be somewhere else. But nobody jumped overboard. The ark, even with all its problems, was their passport to salvation. The ark was their what? Passport to salvation. Folks, this is our ark. And there's probably some dirty things here once in a while. You know, I've heard different folks leave the church for a lot of different reasons. And usually if somebody's offended them, I hear that a lot. Sometimes we offend somebody, we don't even realize we've offended them. If I've offended anybody here today, I apologize, okay? And we need to do that, folks. We need to press together, okay? We don't want to hurt somebody. We don't want to drive them away. I got 10 minutes. Should we go to lunch early? I'm going to tell a story of myself. Is that okay? A few years ago, I was an elder in a church up in Washington on the west side. And we had young people there. And I was really wanting to get our young people involved in the church. And so I came up with the idea of letting our young people, usually the lower teens, lead out in Sabbath school, once a month or once a quarter, I forget what it was. And so we let them do the Sabbath school superintendent, and we even had them teaching an adult class. And we usually had, some of them were rather nervous about that. And I said, well, look, we'll let two of you teach the class together. And they were really growing. It was neat to watch that. But one Sabbath, one of the girls that was up doing the the morning talk for Sabbath school uh, superintendent had said something that offended one of the el other elders or somebody in the church. And, and uh, the next thing I know at the next board meeting, they were saying, we got to quit this. And I, I was in there. I didn't hear anything that was, I thought, inappropriate. And they turned around and said, we're not going to let the young people do this anymore. That broke my heart, man. I said, we need to get them started now. That's the future, our young people that are here. And 
I left the church. I left that church. <laughs> I, I put in my resignation as elder, and I moved my membership to another church, which needed help because they were just starting out. But you know, after about six months or about a year there, still Saul's small voice says, what are you doing here? What do you mean? Who's going to speak up for those children in that other church if you're not there? Oh, Lord. What do you do? I went back. We need to encourage each other, folks. And we need to encourage these young people. Well, I have never seen things going on in the world like they're going on right now. And we need to protect our young children from that. These are our kids. They're not, they don't belong. Those don't belong to Sartan. They belong to all of us. Your kids back there, they don't belong to you. They, they're ours too. Let's remember that. Yeah, we can have them. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe, maybe. Get, my wife will take them, okay? Okay, within most churches, you will encounter a few hypocrites. Anybody here a hypocrite? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Occasional financial challenges, some inconsideration, and more than a few gossips. But, I like the but, but you will also encounter Jesus dwelling among his imperfect people. So don't get discouraged and leave the ship. Just hang in there. The storm outside is much worse. <laughs>